Welcome to the Fast Leader Podcast, where we explore convenient yet effective shortcuts that will help you get ahead and move forward faster by becoming a better leader. And now, here's your host, customer and employee engagement expert and certified emotional intelligence practitioner, Jim Rimbaugh. Call Center Coach develops and unites the next generation of call center leaders. Through our e-learning and community, individuals gain knowledge and skills in the six core competencies that is the blueprint that develops high-performing call center leaders. Successful supervisors do not just happen. So go to callcentercoach.com to learn more about enrollment and download your copy of the Supervisor Success Path eBook now. Okay, Fast Leader Legion, today I'm excited because I have somebody on the show today who's going to give us greater insights into what it takes to be a better leader of self and others. Greg Young was born and raised in Bristol, England. He met his future wife when they were both 15. Unusually, they were born on the same day, same year, and have been together for 42 years. Greg's father was the local county fire chief and mother worked in a school. Greg's mother died from breast cancer when he was in his early 20s, a disease that has claimed many of the female relatives in his life. His only sister has survived cancer and inherited his mother's matriarchal gene. Genetics played an important role in Greg's life and inspired him to study biochemistry, which led to his first career in clinical research in the pharma industry with Glaxo, now GSK. Moving up meant moving around. He spent time with Shearing AG in Berlin and then with Shearing Plow Corp, now Merck. After that, he was courted by a small pharma company, Amlin Pharma, headquartered in San Diego. His second career was a move into telecoms with his first CEO role. In that, he quadrupled the size of the company in four years, seeing the company change from being a traditional phone company to succeeding in the converged world where voice and data flow along the same wires. This was a big cultural change for the company, moving from carrying a toolkit of screwdrivers and wire clippers to programming faulty systems from the office help desk. It was here he learned key leadership skills are transferable. And as CEO, you should measure your day not by what you do, but by what you cause to happen. And you do that by asking the right questions, not telling people what to do. Finally, if you're going to make radical changes, you need to get people to set aside their egos. As it was his first CEO role, he felt it was important to have a coach and mentor, someone outside the system that he could confide in and who understood that he didn't know all the answers. The professional relationship was a good one because in 2004, together with a third person, he founded Leadership Global, a leadership development organization. Through his work at Leadership Global and co-authoring the book titled Leading Beyond the Ego, he has a grand vision to shape the best leaders for the future who will lead beyond the ego, be transpersonal leaders, and leave the world in a better place than they found it. Greg currently lives in Oxford, UK with his wife, Grania, and his two daughters, Emmy and Ailish. Greg Young, are you ready to help us get over the hump? Yeah, ask me a question. <laughs> well, I've given our legion a little bit about you, but can you tell us what your current passion is so that we can get to know you even better? Yeah, sure. Uh, Jim, that's great, because you've already mentioned it, one of the things, and, and that's leading beyond the ego. Um, you know, if we look ahead, there is going to be some huge disruptive challenges that have come, come forward. Artificial intelligence, machine learning, those sorts of things. And if organizations are going to cope well and be agile and cope with that new situation, there's no way that they're not going to be going to need to be radical. So as a leader, you need to be able to be radical in your thinking. But you can be as radical as you like. The challenge is, is bringing people with you. So if we think about leaders of today, they need to be radical, ethical, authentic, because actually social media dictates that they need to be those sorts of things. Then they not only need to be that, but they need to be bring people with them. So the way we think about it, or the way I think about it, is three uses of the word real. So when we first engage with organizations, what we come across, what we find, are leaders who are rational, ego-based, as usual leaders. You probably all know some of those. What we want to be is radical, ethical, authentic leaders. But there's an intermediary step in here, and that's being a robust, emotionally aware leader. Because if you can be a robust, robust emotionally aware leader, then actually what you're going to do is you're going to have followers. Because a leader, there's three things a leader does. The first one is to generate followers. The second is to bring them to a place they wouldn't ordinarily go. And the third is to inspire new leaders. So it's key that you've got to generate followers, and then you need to take them to a place uh, that you need them to be. And that's going to be radical in the future. Gosh, you know, when, as you were talking, I started thinking. And for me, I think a lot of people equate the word radical with risk. And 
Okay. When you start thinking about risk, especially at a leader level, when you have all that responsibility, and also when you start taking into consideration that, I think what I thought a statistic yesterday that said like half of the workforce is over the age of 50. And typically the people who are in that half are the ones who are the leaders who are now going to be relinquishing that power. It seems to me like there's how, how can somebody build the confidence to be able to become radical? Because I would dare to say that most of them are, you just don't start that way. Oh, um, you're, you're absolutely right. You know, the, the organizations are in the hands of people like me, white, middle-aged, older guys. Uh, and, you know, but you've got more generations of young people coming up now who get it. And to some degree, we've got to step out of their way. Well, we've got to be open to change. I mean, you're absolutely right. Radical equals risk. And risk goes both ways. There's a risk of not doing anything, in which case, actually, your organization is vulnerable to those organizations that do get it and are making those radical changes. So the challenge, uh, partly a bigger challenge, is for people in the upper age groups who are used to dealing with very 20th century leadership. That's where I learned my leadership skills in the 20th century. Now we're moving into the 21st century and we need to be more collaborative. We need to be, um, you know, less of knowing about what's in your head, but it's about how you can access the information. Uh, it's about, you know, bringing people on that do know the systems and how to operate the systems as opposed to knowing everything and telling people what to do. Okay. So I have to say that, you know, you, you know, there are a couple of words that you threw out there and systems being one of them and uh, you know, when I started, you know, when I first got the book, Leading Beyond the Ego, and, you know, and you look and you have these these paper, you know, origami type birds. I'm like, oh, this is going to be a little bit soft and fluffy. And that's not what I found between these two covers. I mean, it is very detailed, very technical, systematic, self-assessments, checklists. And, and there's one thing that really stood out to me that I wanted to talk about. And that is your eight I call, which is your eight integrated competencies of leadership. So if we could talk about those a second, I think that would be really helpful for a lot of our listeners. Yeah, sure. Well, eight I call is, uh, you're right, eight, eight integrated competencies of leadership. And, and actually what that illustrates is we make decisions based on different things. We always have uh, our IQ, if you like, those that intellect and logic, those things that are hardwired above a certain threshold. Actually, that's not going to help you any further in your career, providing you've got a base uh, level of intelligence. But then you've got um, other things like personal preferences. So, for example, if you're um, familiar with things like Myers Briggs, you have some people have um, extroverted uh, thinking and other people have introverted thinking. These are our preferences, our Jungian preferences. But yeah, again, you can adapt those to a degree, but those are the things that, that they come with. And then you have a part of the other integrated uh, competencies around emotional intelligence. So this is how self-aware you are, how you manage yourself, how socially aware you are, and then also how you manage those relationships. So that's so much, but then there are other bits beyond that. So what's your purpose? What's your personal conscience? What's your self-determination? So that's about who you are and what you're going to do with who you are. So you've said in the intro to me, I'd like to leave the world in a better place than I left it. So what I'm aware of is who I am as an individual, my values, my uh, behaviors, my, my thoughts, my ethics if you like, and then I can decide what I'm going to do with that. I can either just be, uh, or I can go out and do something about it. So that's one of the reasons behind Leadership Global's uh, vision, if you like, is to, is to create the best leaders, the best transpersonal leaders for the future, so we can have a better world out there. So I, and I think it would be kind of, I mean, you, you talked through it, but I think it'd probably be helpful to talk about what actually makes up from a categorical perspective, you know, these competencies. Um, you you med, did mention personal preferences. You mentioned IQ. Uh, you mentioned self-awareness, self-management, social mm -hmm. awareness, uh, relationship management, personal conscious, and then self-determination. Now, you also mm -hmm. have, I think, really a, a complementary you know, type of framework. When you start looking at the eight I call, it's like, okay, these, this is, makes up me, but then it's how do I actually go about executing, right? So it's that decision-making process piece. And you talk about 
five decision-making processes that we go through. And I, mm. I think those are really critically important because there's some that are conscious and cognitive and some that are unconscious. So let's talk through those for a second. Okay. So you, you, you're right. We've got five ways that we make decisions. The most obvious uh, and the one that probably occupies most people's mind is, is the rational, the logical. And this certainly takes place in big business. So is, is there's a lot of um, analysis and a lot of decision-making based upon market analysis, segmentation, all those sorts of things. And so, you know, it comes as no surprise that this is part of our conscious decision-making process, that, that rational and logic. But there are other influences in there. And there is what we call, would call the three eyes. So that's intuition, instinct, and insight. So intuition is something that is, happens in the unconscious. And it's to do with that, that history, those experiences that you have banked during your own personal lifetime, that, that intuition. So it's got that gut feeling that you have. But then you have, on top of that, you have instinct, and that goes beyond your own lifetime, if you like. That goes into what we have, um, you know, as a species. And so we have instincts around, uh, you know, for example, we see it in nature, you know, birds migrating and, and those sorts of things. These are instincts of these species. And we have it ourselves. And that's also in the, uh, in the unconscious. And then the insights are those things that kind of happen, those aha moments when I'm walking the dog or in the shower, and those, those don't come to us by a logical process. Those come to us because we've cleared our brains of that improved that signal to noise ratio. And suddenly that really knotty problem comes out with a solution. So that's another decision making process. And, and, and then there's a fifth element. And this is an individual's ethical philosophy. And often, you know, this goes beyond um, the culture that we're in. Uh, because the culture that we're in can sh can shift the way that we that our moral philosophy is. So from country to country, culture to culture, that's contained in our moral philosophy. But ethical philosophy goes deeper than that. So we're looking at things like the greater good. What stakeholder we have, and the decision that we're going to make. Which stakeholder is it going to benefit? So those are the five elements that we've got. We've got rational logic. We've got intuition, we've got instinct, we've got insight, and then we've got ethical philosophy on top of that. So I know that with throughout the course of the years, you know, even from a peer perspective, you know, people who you've come across with that were in a leader role and the people who you're working with uh, in order to mm -hmm. help them. When you start thinking about these five decision making processes and you're starting to say, you know, a particular person you're working with needs the most work in one area. I mean, where do you often find that you're having to spend a lot of your effort? In, in terms of helping people with the decision-making process, then it's a really challenging thing in business because, um, you know, often in a, in, a, in a small business, then the leader in that small business will be free to exercise their instinct and their intuition, what have you, and their gut instinct, and they'll just kind of go for it. But when you're talking about a large enterprise, then you know if if the um, yeah if somebody comes up with saying, "This is my decision. Trust me," then there are a whole load of people around them saying, "Well, you know, what evidence is there for?" Them? So there's a huge amount of post hoc rationalisation that then goes on to try and uh, kind of look at that. But also we you know in terms of the ethical philosophy, uh, so we did some work with uh, one multinational global organisation around uh, ethics in decision-making and ethical leadership. And it was quite clear that the primary motivation was for commercial success. And if, there could, if the organization could be ethical at the same time, then that was a nice bolt-on. That was a nice to have. So, so the, the, the people in the room, these top 16 in the organization, uh, we asked them the simple question, you know, why would it be a good thing for this organization to be an ethical organization? And they came up with 13 reasons. And those reasons varied from um, building trust in the organization. Uh, and of course, trust has implications outside of the company with suppliers and customers uh, and within the organization of retaining and attracting the best talent, right the way down to it helps me to sleep better at night. And then we asked them the next question. 
we said, which of these 13 points that you've come up with would confer a commercial advantage? And they worked through each one. And what they realized was each one of those, irrespective of its impact or magnitude, if you like, conferred a commercial advantage. And in the room at that moment, there was a big aha moment, which reframed the whole thing from being, uh, instead of being commercial first, and the ethics is a nice to have, it was let's bring the ethics and the commercial together, because if we do that, we'll be more commercially successful than we were before. Well, I think that's a really important point that you make, because uh, and I've mentioned this before on the show for those who are regular listeners, but my next door neighbor was the, the dean of a university's business school for 20, 22, mm-hmm. 23 years. I mean, very long tenured. And uh, I was having a discussion with him about ethics a, a couple of years ago. And he basically said that, you know, ex- executives will not give any time to ethics or the discussion of ethics because they don't feel that it makes them any money. But it's great to hear that you're actually doing the work and they're actually being able to see it so that we have a brighter future. Absolutely. And, and there's a downside as, as well to that in as much as, you know, if you if you exercise unethical practice, especially with social media now where virtually every bit of news gets out, is circulated and goes viral. Um, you know, those organizations who behave in a less than ethical way, they'll be found out. And actually, there'll be damage of reputation, there'll be commercial uh, impacts, there'll be fines, all manner of things. We're seeing it in so many companies now. Well, and as they say, once it's on the internet, it never, never goes away, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, what we're talking about here, I mean, you're talking about the personal development, organizational development, all, all of these things, uh, and being able to go through the effort of transforming yourself. Uh, requires mm-hmm. a whole lot of effort and a whole lot of inspiration. And one of the things that we look at on the show to help give us some inspiration are quotes. Do you have a quote sure. or two that you can share that you like? I do. I do. It's a, it's actually a quote from Leo Tolstoy. I, I'm not sure if you you know it, but it goes, everyone thinks about changing the world, but nobody thinks about changing themselves. And if you go right the way back to the beginning of this interview, when you were talking about you know older leaders, um, you know, they really need to be equipped to change themselves in, in order to change the organizations that they're in. Yeah. And that's one of the things that we talk about on the Fast Leader Show is, uh, is you know, the, the me first thing. I mean, that's an important yeah. thing. Um, it, it all has Absolutely. to start there. And, and uh, you also mentioned a really important point that I think everybody needs to be aware of is that you can't do it on your own. I mean, you, you can't oftentimes see yourself because your eyes point outward right you need somebody else Mm -hmm. to kind of point things out and have that confidant Uh, and and i think you know you had mentioned even before that especially if you're a person who's like in in the top position that's a very lonely spot because it's hard to find people who will actually give you the truth that you need to hear yeah i mean you're right you know and uh something else we're always afraid of being judged I, i i think as well so um for me, the best thing I did was ever uh, was ever to get a coach because that was somebody outside the system I could be really open and honest with. Uh, and I knew that that person was there in service of me. Uh, and, you know, I could I could just even if I was just vocalizing stuff and somebody was bouncing stuff back on me, then that was a, you know, a great thing to, to begin with but also develop the relationship with people around you so that you can be open, transparent. You know, I think that, um, you know, especially if you're able to take your ego out of the system, then, you know, being vulnerable in front of other people and, and asking them and, and, and um, you know, just expressing that, you know what, you don't have all the answers. Uh, you know, it, it's, a, you know, it's a real help. It's a real help and it's a, a real way of being more inclusive and getting the organization moving forward. Well, and it's been found over again that that is a huge trust building component is that people gain more trust in you when you have that type of humility. Sure. So I know when you start talking about going from, uh, you know, the being in the in the chemical industry, going to CEO, doing what you're Mm -hmm. doing now, there's been a whole lot of transitions. And I'm sure there's a whole lot of humps to get over and a lot of things that you've learned along the way. Is there a story that you can share with us so that we can actually (laughs) learn better? Uh, yeah, well, I, I tell you, the one of my my own big aha moments was um, in that role of my first CEO, and it, it was a it was an organisation I was taking through a period of radical change, uh, and that was uh, in telecoms we call it convergence, which is when voice and data come together into one system, 
and the organization that I was leading uh, it was a very traditional organization and they were mostly used to working with telephone systems and, and many of the employees were an ex-state-owned uh, organization. So they were used to a very slow-moving uh, organization and I needed to make things happen quickly and radically, otherwise we'd lose market share. And so uh, I had a to-do list as you do and every night I'd be going home and beating myself up because not only was I not achieving my to-do list, but um, it was getting longer and longer each day and I was spending longer and longer at the office and I was getting less and less sleep. So you can imagine it could easily become a downward spiral. And then a personal aha moment for me was when I one day was out walking the dog and I thought, I need to reframe my day. I need to reframe what I consider to be a successful day. And in that moment, instead of measuring my day by what I did, I began to measure my day by what I caused to happen. Oh, there was another metric as well, which was how full my bin was at the end of the day. But let's just focus on the first one. So from that moment on, I used to spend less and less time in my office and more and more time walking around the, the business and simply asking the right questions in a really uh, open coaching way. I had intelligent people working with me. So they knew what the answer was. They just needed to get that answer out there themselves. So that was my big aha moment for me, was to measure my my day, not by what I did, but what I caused to happen. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I mean, even if you're an individual com contributor, uh, I think you can also use that as a means by which, you know, you can get a sense of accomplishment because you're contributing also to what gets done. And so mm -hmm. being able to understand that impact is important. And you have to maybe go walk the dog to figure it out sometimes, right? <laughs> oh, dogs are brilliant in that respect. Yeah. You need, yeah. You need to go and walk the dog <laughs> and do the naughty problems. You're absolutely right. Yeah. So, okay. So you got the book. I, I looked at your organization as a whole. Um, you know, I'm here in the States, but it doesn't look like you guys have a whole lot of presence in the States, but you're doing work in a lot of other parts of the world. You got the book, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to promote it. And, you, you know, of course, you know, family's important to you. We didn't talk also mm -hmm. about the work that you're doing in order to help create that gender equality in the workplace. And you're doing some important work there. But when you look at all the things that you have going, what would be one goal that you have? Uh, well, you know, I, you know, I always think, and, and, and this is partly what led to the writing of the book it is, you know, what's my purpose? And, you know, when I was in, when I was in business, you know, I could help the people that were in the business, but in a, the kind of organization that we're in now, Leadership Global, then you think what sort of impact can I have on a broader audience? Jim, you're absolutely right. We don't have a huge presence in the States right now, but we're working on that. Uh, but what we do have is that we have presence in, uh, in India, in Kazakhstan, in Africa, in, in South America. And actually, we're getting the transpersonal message out there. We're getting that if you, uh, if you want to make the world a better place, lead beyond your ego. Take your ego out of it. And, and that's the thing that drives me right now is how many people can we touch to get this message across that actually taking your ego out of the system uh, makes for far better uh, leadership, far better performance for organizations, but it also leads to ethical organizations and authentic leaders. And the Fast Leader Legion wishes you the very best. Now, before we move on, let's get a quick word from our sponsor. An even better place to work is an easy-to-use solution that gives you a continuous diagnostic on employee engagement along with integrated activities that will improve employee engagement and leadership skills in everyone. Using this award-winning solution is guaranteed to create motivated, productive, and loyal employees who have great work relationships with their colleagues and your customers. To learn more about an even better place to work, visit beyondmorale.com forward slash better. All right, here we go, Fast Leader Legion. It's time for the Hump Day Hoedown. Okay, Greg, the Hump Day Hoedown is the part of our show where you give us good insights fast. So I'm going to ask you several questions, and your job is to give us robust yet rapid responses that are going to help us move onward and upward faster. Greg Young, are you ready to hoedown? I think so. All right. So what do you think is holding you back from being an even better leader today? Oh, well, I'm still working on getting my ego out of the system, I can tell you, because I don't like being judged. So, um, yep, get your ego out. What is the best leadership advice you have ever received? Uh, I would say that, um, yeah, absolutely, is measure your day by what you cause to happen uh, and not what you do. What is one of your secrets that you believe contributes to your success? 
listen, <laughs> to, to, you know, th there's a, 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 um, a survey in the UK as to whether your company is going to be in the top 100 or not. And the most significant question in the battery of or ones that they ask is that the senior leadership in this organization do more listening than telling. So I think the secret weapon is to listen. What do you feel is one of your best tools that helps you lead in business or life? Uh, empathy. Put yourself in the shoes of other people. And if once you understand them, you know their motivations, then you can lead them better and they'll follow you. What would be one book that you'd recommend to our listeners? And it can be from any genre. Of course, we're going to put a link to Leading Beyond the Ego, How to Become a Transpersonal Leader on your show notes page as well. Do you know, one of the books I use in a lot of the work I do is To Kill a Mockingbird. I'd certainly um, recommend that as a leadership book. Okay, Fast Leader Legion, you can find links to that and other bonus information from today's show by going to fastleader.net slash Greg Young. Okay, Greg, this is my last hump day out on question. Imagine you were given the opportunity to go back to the age of 25, and you've been given the knowledge and skills that you have now, and you can take them back with you, but you can't take everything. You can only choose one. So what skill or piece of knowledge would you take back with you, and why? Yeah, that's the one I take. When I was young, I was a young Turk. I knew everything. Um, I was cocky. And you know what? Just a little bit of modesty. Take back, and then you get people on your side. Definitely. Greg, it was an honor to spend time with you today. Can you please share with the Fast Leader Legion how they can connect with you? Sure. You can uh, reach me on uh, LinkedIn. Um, or if you want to email me, you can email me on gyoung at leadershipglobal.com. Greg Young, thank you for sharing your knowledge and wisdom. The Fast Leader Legion honors you and thanks you for helping us get over the hump. Thank you for joining me on the Fast Leader Show today. For recaps, links from every show, special offers, and access to download and subscribe, if you haven't already, head on over to fastleader.net so we can help you move onward and upward faster. 